Okay, so hello and welcome to Try to Understand. I'm Katrina. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and some other important identities I hold are I am mixed race, Filipino and German. Uh, I'm bisexual and I'm a cis woman. I'm joined by my co-facilitator, Miguel. Hi everyone, my name is Miguel. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. A um, few important identities I hold is that I'm Native Pacific Islander, uh, specifically Chamorro to the island of Guam. Um, I am a gay man, uh, a gay cis man, and I'm also a facilitator, but unfortunately my computer isn't as cool as everybody else's, so I don't have the fancy background. Today, uh, we will be discussing uh, the transracial adoptee identity with our panelists. Uh, panelists, if you're comfortable, will you please introduce yourselves with names, pronouns, and other important identities that you want to share? Uh, afterwards, we'll begin our discussion. Shiana, if you want to go first. Hi, I'm Shian. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a transracial adoptee. I'm Chinese. Um, I identify as um, a woman of color, um, a pandemi, and as a disabled individual. Hi, I'm Luca. I'm a transracial adoptee, and um, my pronouns are he, him, his, and uh, some important identities to me are um, I'm, well, transracial adoptee, um, I identify as Chinese, um, I identify as bisexual, and um, I think that's it, yeah. Oops. Uh, Caitlin, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kaylin Vaughn. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am um, a master's student here at CS here, I guess, subjectively here, <laughs> uh, at CSU. Um, I'm also a transracial transnational adoptee from China. I was adopted when I was eight months. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so our other panelists I think something might have happened with her Wi-Fi, but um, we can go ahead and start asking questions. And then once she gets back in, have her introduce herself and, oh, wait, here she is, cool. As a reminder to everyone in the audience, um, or our panelists do, if y'all want us to ask specific questions, feel free to message me. Uh, and then I could send it uh, to the question list. Uh, Natalie, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself really quick. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Natalie. So I had some trouble with my audio. Great time for my computer to just restart. Um, do we just say name? Is that it? Uh, name, pronoun, and then any other identities that are important to you. And then pronouns is she, hers. Thank you. Nice. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, questions. Uh, first one is, what does APEDA mean to you? And if you don't already know, APEDA stands for Asian Pacific Islander Desi American. Yeah, so for me, um, it kind of has become that like umbrella term. Um, this is my fifth year at CSU. So I'm sure Kaylin can also remember, but when I first started at least, the acronym was different. It was AAPI, um, so Asian American Pacific Islander. And so APEDA, I feel like encompasses more. And while it does still leave out an amount of people, it at least we're working on trying to figure out to add more. I think it's a similar like conundrum with the LGBTQ plus community is like, which letters do we add and which do we not just because there's so many and what word do we use to um, basically like include everyone but for me that's the term that kind of like includes everyone for now um, and yeah I just kind of have found it to be like my Asian family so yeah. Um, 
kind of similar to Shion, um, it's to me, it's more of just like a definition of like encompassing like all of um, all cultures and um, ethnicities of Asia. Uh, it's just a big umbrella term covering basically everything from Eastern Asian to Indian to, you know, Polynesian, that kind of stuff. Um, that's just what I hold it as, as a uh, very much of a big umbrella term for a large community. Yeah, I would kind of echo what my other two panelists have kind of said that it is more of an inclusive kind of encompassing of the different identities. So it's not just when people assume just kind of more like Eastern Asian. I really enjoy that it's more expanded out. Um, for me, I've been thinking about, um, I'm taking a class specifically about um, like woman of color feminism. And so for me, like the origination of women of color was not a label prescribed by like, like white society, like white men, but it was a politi politicized term. And so I think something I've been thinking about within that, within other conversations too, has been the way that is a pedo, a politicized identity that is in a way that we're working for, like, for all of us together in that type of movement? Or is it more of a umbrella term to homogenize Asia as it has been used and also the way Pacific Islanders are like then tucked in there? Um, so as someone who was there when it was, um, oh my gosh, oh, the, the other history month, when I first was a first year to what it is now, um, kind of makes me just question a lot of things, but also understand the need to recognize the heterogeneity of like Asian America Pacific Island dirtiness in um, the way a homogenizing term tries to like homogenize it. I don't know. I don't really know, but that's where I'm at. Okay, so moving on to our next questions. Um, what are your experiences with the model minority myth and if um, you're not sure of that, um, there's a description of what that is in the chat. So growing up um, with a white family, um, I didn't really necessarily have that come from like my mom or my family. I think I just naturally got it from like other like students, which is weird because I feel like I first learned about it or not learned about it but like experienced it was more in elementary school as I was like a lot of kids being like oh well you're Asian like you should be smart and then like in middle school and high school I had like the highest math scores and I remember one of my teachers um for algebra she would always post who had the highest um test score basically and so like I was always like almost always on the board kind of thing and so it was like kind of weird and I think I even played into it a little bit too with like my best friend growing up, um, she's Filipina. And for me, I kind of was like, she wasn't very good at math. And I was like, but you're Asian, why aren't you good at math? And so it's just kind of weird in terms of that in terms of like the educational aspect is where I got my experience and just being like, oh, well, like I have to have the best grades. And I kind of did that within myself because even my mom was never like, oh, you got to see like that's super bad. She's always like, oh, you can try again next time. And I was like, no, I have to do better. So I think it all just came within myself in terms of that. So I had a pretty different experience from that. Um, uh, I got adopted by uh, a white family and living in that white family, my, uh, my parents and all six of my siblings, yes, all six of them are all white. Um, and they're all natural born to my uh, parents. So they all are very comfortable with the idea of pushing like a, of like model minority and stereotype. And so they would all push that on me um, from the age of uh, five and growing up like uh, throughout middle school and high school. Um, like I remember when I was a little kid, I because I was adopted at the age of five and I didn't speak any English, I had to basically fast track through my first through third grade. And I got through all those and um, in one year and so my parents really solidified like the idea and like drilled it into my head like the idea of like being a model minority like um my sister would fail a test in high school and she 
we'll just get a pat on the back and uh, you can try again next time. But I would get the, you need to do better um, for my parents, uh, almost regardless of what grade I got. So uh, that's been my experience with it. And it's also been pushed on me by the education system as well and um, peers growing up, they'd always be like, why aren't you good at math? Why aren't you, you know, like faster at this? Like, why aren't you like um, all this kind of stuff? And I, and I definitely conformed to that and drilled it into my own head of uh, being uh, good at math, essentially STEM stuff a lot. Um, yeah, and that's my experience with it. Yeah, my experience with it, I'm trying to think more recently. When I was a college of business student, I saw really this identity of model minority and my identity of being a woman intersecting a lot, especially when it came to like leading and that every presentation, my white males, he, they would always just assume that I didn't want to speak if it was because of my accent or somehow like I would always just want to be more of a submissive kind of side role in any project, and especially presenting. I've also really noticed it before that, just like in schooling a lot, it's kind of ingrained in my family, this like combination of like really work hard because like this quote, American dream and how that kind of intersects with like the model minority myth. And I've always kind of struggled with the model minority because I really pride myself on working hard and like achievable is one of the Clifton strengths and having that interweb with model minority. I'm like, am I working hard? But I don't want to work hard because then I'm fulfilling this myth, but I don't want to not. And the, uh, confusion. So yeah, that's kind of my struggle with it. Um, for me, I think um, it, I definitely encountered it in the schooling system. But for me, what was more, what has become more salient is I remember the times like my family put that on me, I think. Um, and so the ways kind of similar uh, to Luca was like, like, oh, you should, you should be trying harder. Or like, if I do better than my cousins did at high school during their time, it was like expected of like, oh yeah, of course. And I'm like, what do you mean, of course? So um, the fact that I definitely did encounter it and it definitely means something different when it's coming from like your family, like the people who you would hope wouldn't be doing it, but are the ones who are putting this on you. Hi, I'm Oki, she, her, hers. And I am a Korean adoptee um, at age six uh, to a very white family. And um, I didn't know any English. I had to learn English really fast and was told by the orphanage that if I didn't learn English, that they would return me back. So I was kind of in a rut there. Um, I, being that I started, because I came in December, so it was like, um, half a semester of kindergarten, learning how to speak English quickly. My mom would buy like letter blocks and spell words for me. I learned a lot of uh, different ways of learning English pretty quickly. Um, then the school, because I grew up in Hawaii, thought that I was a gifted child. So I skipped. Um, middle of third and then went to fourth. So then, long story short, I was not a gifted child. I just learned certain things really fast. I hated math. Um, my my dad adopted my adoptee dad was um, both both my parents were um, teachers, which didn't help me at all. Anyway. Um, my dad was strong with science and math, and my mom was strong with English and history, so I had no excuse, pretty much. Um, but growing up, um, I have a brother that is their child. So I was, because of the age difference, we were, I think, six and a half years apart. I was pretty much um, his babysitter, caretaker learned how to do all those ropes um, pretty fast. Um, so there was a lot of other expectations that were given to me from my parents, as it is. 
But growing up in Hawaii, there were plenty of Asians there. So I didn't feel like I was completely out of place. However, the minute I came here, I felt totally out of place. So um, I can, I, I moved here in 84, just to give you an idea how long I've been here. And finding people of your, either your race or even another Asian was uh, far too in between. And they always, I mean, what I used to get a lot is, are you Japanese? Are you Chinese? What are you? Are you Vietnamese? You know, and I'm like, why? <laughs> but um, yeah, um, my parents really wanted me to do very well in school, but I didn't. That's, that's uh, something that I think they were expecting. I was excelling so quickly in elementary. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, moving on to our next question that definitely expands on that. Um, so what is your story and how, how did that bring you here to like CSU or even APAC? Uh, so I was adopted at the age of two um, by my mom and I grew up in Reno, Nevada. And so that area is like 50% Latinx and then like 25% pretty much other people of color and then like 25% like white. So I grew up with like very much diversity and culture and like had pretty much everyone in my friend group was like a different race or ethnicity. And so that was like the experience that I had growing up. And then at the age of 16, my mom unfortunately passed away and I was then adopted again by my aunt and uncle. So my mom's sister and her husband, um, and they were living in Colorado at the time. So that was in the middle of my sophomore year of high school. And so I moved to Colorado and that was my first like really big culture shock as I was like one of 10 people of color total in the high school that I went to. And so for me, I was like, oh my goodness, like not realizing that like other parts of the world and even like the country are that different. And so I just ended up going to CSU because it was in state. Um, the other choice that I was going to go to would either be like Hawaii at Manoa and I wasn't sure if I was ready to be that far away because I knew that I could get by in terms of finances of going there, but I knew I wouldn't be able to come like home during breaks and all that. So I was like, I don't know if I can last nine months like solid without seeing my family. Um, so I ended up going to CSU. So um, I was adopted when I was, um, five years old and um, and I was raised in Colorado all my life essentially. And I've always lived around either purely white or like maybe one to 2% like uh, people of color in that area. I've always been around with that. And so like, um, so like I was always like trained to like be white essentially because like my parents like didn't like it like my family would make fun of me when I studied like anything like that had to do with like Asian culture and stuff like that so like they would actively deter me from studying um something I found important to my own identity um since I was like five years old like I remember like on um one of the uh like Chinese New Year's uh, they all made fun of me for the entire day because it was that day and just because it was that day and just because I was Asian um, and so like, I've always been trained to basically avoid, um, that part of my identity. And so like, um, throughout high school, I like stayed a lot in robotics cause I didn't want to go home, obviously. Um, so, um, in doing that, I learned a lot about STEM and stuff like that. And I remember my, um, my freshman year, I took two math classes because, you know, I'm a minority mindset. Um. And so my sister was like, you're not gonna pass one of them. So like, don't bother going to STEM. So I did, I went into STEM out of spite, essentially. I, 
like um I applied for CSU and I applied for the double degree in engineering and I remember getting it and I was like and you're going to school for like accounting LE so it, that's not against anyone who goes to, who does accounting as a major that's just against my sister like that is not let me clarify <laughs> um but that's kind of how I ended up at CSU and um yeah Yeah, let's see my story. I was adopted about 10 months, almost a year from China. My mom and dad came and adopted me and we lived in Northern California, kind of the San Francisco Bay Area, which is very diverse, a very large Chinese American community as well. After, until I was about 10, then we moved to Poco, Colorado, which is just southeast of Denver. And I actually, that was a big cultural shock, by the way, because I didn't even know I was a minority until I came here. And there was no Asian. I was like, what? What? I was very confused. I lost my train of thought. Okay. And then I decided to come up to CSU because my mom told me I could either become an accountant, funny you mentioned that, an accountant or a chemist. So I was like, I guess accountant, it might be fun. I was wrong. I was marketing, by the way, so don't worry about the whole accounting thing. But I think what really drew me to CSU and to choosing it was when I learned about APAC. I was so shocked that there was an entire center that I could find a community. I was like, oh my gosh, I could find people like me and maybe find other people who shared my experiences because really throughout high school, I never had that. So that's why I really chose CSU. And I heard that CSU really pride itself on diversity and inclusion. And I felt like my high school in specific wasn't that much at all. So I really was looking for that. And that's why I chose CSU versus maybe an out-of-state school. Um, so I was adopted at eight months um, by my single white mother uh, from uh, Chongqing, China. Um, I grew up in Aurora, Colorado, which is pretty diverse. Um, but I spent a lot of time with my aunt and uncle and my cousins who live in Littleton, which is they were almost the very opposite. Um, so I got both experiences simultaneously, which um, I can see how it was, is very foundational and how I understand myself. Um, I chose CSU because it was in state. Uh, financially, it made sense. I had a scholarship that made me meet with Joanne my freshman year and every year because that was a requirement. And so that's how I came in contact with APAC. Um, my third and fourth year, I worked for RAM events, which meant I worked with APAC as a liaison, and so it's been a great relationship ever since. Yes, okay. So moving on to our next question. Um, when did you first realize that you looked different from your family, and how did that affect you? Um, I don't really remember the first time and maybe it is the first time, but like, I think the one that like made the most impact on me is like, I had, um, my fellow classmates in elementary school, they would make fun of me for my eyes because they're not like open enough. Um, and a lot of that and then being like yellow essentially. And I just remember also like, I think the first time I realized I was adopted is when someone was like, why don't you look like your mom? And I was like, what do you mean I don't look like my mom? Like, to me, that didn't process at that age. And so I remember just coming home and like crying about it. And like my mom just like explaining everything to me, of, like, oh, how I'm adopted and how I'm not like she is in terms of like race and ethnicity. And I think it affected me in terms of just like, it never did anything with like my relationship with my mom. And I was always like super close with her. Um, if anything, it probably made me closer with her. Um, and it definitely just made me more aware of like my self identity and my identity towards the other kids that I was growing up around. And since I did grow up in a more diverse area for me, um, very much like Natalie, it was like, until I came to Colorado, I didn't really think about being a minority because I was the majority. And so I, it was just living life until I came to Colorado. And I think that's more to also of like, that I'm very different from my family, um, in terms of just like how I look also, and just everyone else around me. Um, so when you first realized, sorry, I have a very short term memory. Um, 
so my family has like never my family being white like I remember being adopted so like I knew like this wasn't my genetic family obviously um but they would never really let me forget that um for example like I've always been like excluded like from a bunch of stuff like in my family um like my sisters would all hang out and my uh the people that are younger than me would hang out, but they would always just be like, you go figure out what you're doing. Um, it was as light as that, or as like, um, or as direct as like, just using slurs when they're angry at me. Um, so like, I've never uh, not known that I look different from my family. Everything from like, um, calling me chink, um, uh, China man, like all, like a bunch of different stuff. Um, I've never, I've always known that like I would look different and it's affected me greatly because like I, until very recently, like, like I've been extremely ad like adverse to like studying or like watching like documentaries on like Asian culture or like anything having to do with like Asian culture, like social justice for Asians. Like I didn't realize there were any social issues for Asians. I didn't realize that racism was being, you know, propagated onto Asians until one of my friends like, hey, your sister just called you a slur when she got angry at you. And I was like, oh, you may be right. Um, and so like, uh, yeah, that's how it's affected me. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to think of like, all your memories of when it kind of affected me was the surprise look on my friend's faces whenever my mom would come pick me up from school or something. They were like, oh, she's white. I'm like, she is like, I, I don't know what expression they wanted me to have, but I think a really familiar one was my best friend growing up in Colorado. She's white, blonde hair, blue eyes, pretty much looks identical to my mom. So in any setting that the two of us would go out with my mom for like dinner or something, they would always assume like, I'm the friend like, oh, like a mom and daughter day and plus one. And I was like, oh. So I think that messaging over and over and over kept making me almost believe like, Maybe I am other, like maybe this is how the family is supposed to look here. And then I'm like, what's wrong with me? Why don't they always just put me together? And kind of Colorado and Parker wasn't, had a lot of biracial families. So I saw that a lot growing up. And I think also with my name, because my name is Natalie Lester. And I think with like parent teacher conferences, especially people would see my name and my mom was white. So they're like, she's white. Then I wouldn't be white. And I really surprised them. So I think that is really incorporated in that it has affected me because I almost reiterated that I didn't belong and that somehow I didn't fit in this picture that was already preset for me, which is really difficult, like especially growing up and you're trying to figure out who you are, but you keep getting messaging that who you are isn't who they wanted you to be in a way. Um. Oh my gosh. Uh, um, I, when I talked to my mom, she said I always knew, but I didn't really necessarily know, know how. Um, my a friend that I have now, she um, in kindergarten was like, you can't be part of a group because you're Chinese. And I was like, who's Chinese? So the similar, like, like this disassociation of if you look in the, the mirror of your family that you think is supposed to be like you and they're not like you, that sends differing messages. Um, it's affected me a lot, honestly, like growing up in a white family, in white spaces, in whiteness, it's been a hot mess. It continues to be a hot mess. I'm still figuring it out. Um, I mean, like I'm, I did a whole master's on trying to understand my identity as a transracial, transnational adoptee and it's still not together. And so I think it's a like lifelong process of a lot of contradictions that can really be like, like very violent to the, like, like yourself. And so it's definitely been really hard. Um, okay, do, do you have uh, anything to add for that or any experiences? Well, um, growing up in Hawaii, I'd always get questions like, why are you hanging out with that Howley family? And it's like, because uh, they're my parents and that's my brother. And they're like, what? So they'd 
those are the kind of questions that I always got, you know, growing up in Hawaii, because I looked like a local girl, fit with the local group, but that was when I had to figure out, okay, well, if I'm not supposed to be hanging out with the white group, the Howleys, then what am I going to do with myself, you know, with, without a family? So it was very weird um, having to deal with that because I was kind of sort of torn in between in a way. Um, do I try and hang out with more Howleys or hang out with my local group? So it's like, um, well, I went, I went to a private school and it was predominantly white group. And I didn't like that. I wanted to come back home desperately to my local group. And it was, um, you know, I had to be there instead. And it was a different island school that I went to. So I felt like I was um, kind of tossed into the wolves because I went to a boarding, they had me go to a boarding school. So I, um, I kind of grew up feeling like I didn't belong with this family of mine majority of the time. So that was something that was um, my maturity level was not quite there, obviously, when you're still in high school. And because I graduated at an early age, um, I had this tendency of who I wanted to hang out with. But my parents also taught me some things that um, they were uh, biased about. So they would tell me, don't, ha don't hang out with Filipinos or don't hang out with certain nationality because you know they're stupid or they do dumb things or they're always in trouble or with the law and, and it's like what i had filipino classmates you know or filipino i used to go to rec school and visit all my local friends so i had a variety of ethnicity that i i liked hanging out with not just my white family so when i was growing up and um i didn't hang out with a lot of korean people my own ethnicity but i did hang out with all the people that i was not supposed to hang out with so i was a rebel growing up now i'm just different <laughs> nice okay so Moving on to our next question, um, did you want to connect more with your ethnic culture? And if so, what challenges did you face? Uh, so as a little kid, my mom actually tried to get me into like more things about being Chinese. Um, I remember having like basic um, like English to Chinese dictionaries and um, the community would kind of do like every summer they'd have like a Chinese festival um, where they'd have like traditional dances and like just different things of that. And it's like, I enjoyed going to like the festivals and stuff, but in terms of like trying to actively learn, I wasn't like super big and I didn't really like reading in a sense. And so I didn't really try to connect too much with like that. And I really wish my mom had forced me more about it um because growing up with like everything I did if I didn't want to do it um she was just like okay then you don't have to do it anymore um and so I kind of wish that she had forced me to do it just so I could have that background now um because trying to start that up now is definitely a lot harder than it would have been as a kid so um Obviously, like I said earlier, my parents really didn't like me, you know, studying anything about Asian culture slash um, identity. Um, but there was this weird double-edged sword that they had for me where um, they would allow me to like, they would actively encourage me to like go into like Chinese classes and stuff like that and like learn the language, but enough to like essentially like um, 
uh, God, I can't think of it. Like, uh, essentially, like, capitalist mech thought process where like oh like that'd be good for like marketing or like whatever career you want to go into but like beyond that like don't look into it like I remember when I was um I was homeschooled when I was younger so I remember once like I asked my mom I was like why can't I study like I was reading all these like um American history books and I was like why can't I study like Asian history and she was like that's not your history uh she told me like that's not your history and she handed me like some like Chris like Christopher Columbus and was like this your history and I remember just being like all right, whatever. Um, and so, like, I was steered heavily away from studying anything having to do with that culture. And, like, even in high school, like, if I, like, there was an Asian club, but I went to East High School in Denver. So, like, it was a bunch of white people who, you know, fair sized Asians. So, that was not really my favorite thing. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I remember that, like, I just know that, like, I've wanted to, like, to this day, I still want to study more, um, learn more about my own culture and my own ethnicity and see what that means for me. But um, because for the past, like, majority of my life, um, I have been actively steered away and deterred, um, either directly, indirectly, verbally, uh, Im implicitly, like just, uh, I've had a bunch of, like my entire family, my entire life, just be like, do not study your culture because that is not your culture and you are not Asian. So that's been my experience with it. Um, Yeah, I think growing up in California, I definitely wanted to get more connected with my ethnic culture. And it was a lot easier to be able to do that because there was a larger Chinese American community and kind of more acceptance. I think especially coming to Colorado, it wasn't so much that I didn't want to, is that there wasn't a lot of opportunity to. There wasn't a lot of like groups that I knew or like resources I could use to learn more. And now as kind of more like a young adult, I almost feel like I'm too late like if I start learning more about my ethnic culture I'm like oh I feel like I should have known this like when I was eight or nine and now I'm just learning this I almost feel a little embarrassed because especially in some of my friend groups that are diverse and if I'm the only like Chinese American who identifies as that I become like somehow the export I'm like I don't know I'm I'm learning this kind of beside you in a way so I think I wanted to connect more with my like ethnic culture but I felt like I wasn't always supposed to be in those spaces because I never felt like I was almost quote Chinese enough to kind of fit in with those friends but then I wasn't white so I didn't really know where I kind of fit so being confused I just kind of chose to just give up and not really embrace either culture fully which was kind of hard growing up because now as I think about becoming more of an adult and having a family someday I want my children to have that culture but I almost wished that younger, I was more accessed, more, I was able to kind of embrace my culture a little bit more so I could pass that on. Um, for me, I rejected it as a kid. My mom sent me to like heritage camps and like learn language and like stuff like that. And I heavily rejected it. You know, I didn't want to be different from my family because at that age, you we all were pointing out differences in schools and stuff. And so it was like, how can I not be labeled as different? Um, uh, I, I, in my paper, in my, <laughs> in the research that I'm doing, um, something that I'm really struggling with too, is this, uh, this authentic Chinese-ness that we are trying to achieve or that is imposed to be achieved. And um, in many ways, the, things I struggle with are more the racialization of like my body like when it enters spaces less than the way that whatever ethnicity I'm perceived as um, because it's like my family taught me in these very like ethnicity as ideology ways of like this is how you play the role of being Chinese. And then thus you are authentic. Like if you kind of know how to speak it, if you celebrate those one's holidays, then you have achieved a Chinese-ness that is good enough to play a role that looks like I did enough as a parent to make you seem more authentic and I gave you the resources. Uh, but for me, it's more about like, what is the racialization of the way that the US really imposes other things on the, Asian American umbrella label on um, 
on my body as I walk anywhere in the way that it was always different with my family or without my family. Because with my family, people assumed I was adopted because there was a bunch of white people and I was the only one who looked different. But when I'm alone, no one gives a flying who often who my parents are and where I came from, but they see me as showing up as um, Asian American, Chinese American. And because I know H Mart, I know Pacific Ocean and Mart, like I can code as being more authentically Asian and I get a pass like I'm more authentically Asian because I can talk about these supermarkets and somehow that makes me more Asian. Um, but really grappling with like the way that ethnicity was a way to conflate race in a way that my, my mom and my family still don't have to deal with the fact that I am racialized in a way they are not and they won't understand and the work they have to do to, to work with me so that we can see each other at where we're located. So growing up, um, I would like to say that I didn't know any r real Korean culture um, until I actually came here and started to meet people that were Koreans. I was pr predominantly very white raised family. And even though in Hawaii, we have a lot of variety of Asians. Um, I didn't hang out with too, too many Koreans um, until I was in high school. When I went to a public high school uh, my junior and senior year. Then that's when I actually met some Korean people. We got, they had a Korean club and I joined that one. Um, but it wasn't like a very big group. So it was still something I was trying to learn because I hadn't learned it through growing up until high school. So once I got, you know, the feel for the food and what I was missing out on, I wanted to um, expand that. So when I came here, it was a huge shock. Um, back in early 80s, it's like, where are the Asians? Are there such a thing? Um, and it wasn't until, I want to say, whew, closer to 1990s, when I actually finally met a Korean family. So that was exciting. And then they uh, shared their culture with me and um, they wanted to know where I was from. So they were telling me about my hometown that I was at the orphanage. So I got to learn a little bit more about that. So, but it, it, it wasn't until I was an adult that um, I was able to actually learn about my culture, my ethnicity. So it was kind of weird. My parents really didn't try to um, take me to Korean culture or Korean restaurants or you know any of that stuff in Hawaii. Um, I probably did more Hawaiian things because I took Polynesian dancing and learned how to do the um, the whole luau process and so it seems like I did, you know as a Korean being raised by white family, um, it just seemed like they didn't want me to know my ethnicity, uh, culture. So that was, uh, I didn't worry about it until I was an adult. So it was kind of weird. Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you. Moving on to our next question. Um, did you ever feel that you had to choose between the culture you were born into and the culture you were raised in? And if you did decide, what did you decide and why? Um, I think growing up, I didn't really 
know that there was a difference. Um, I knew that like I looked different than my mom and my family and that I guess like racially that I was different, but I didn't really understand like a concept of culture and how that it was different. And so for me, I kind of, that's all I know is like white culture. And I think now as like an adult and being more like aware that there's a difference, I don't necessarily feel like I pick one just because I'm so rooted in white culture, but I have definitely tried to learn more about Asian culture. And I think like, I kind of just learned from like all my friends, even though they're not necessarily like Chinese, but I think that I just am trying to like take in as much as I can and learn it now um, and try to give myself that education and kind of in a sense, like Natalie was saying earlier, that like I want my children to know about the culture from like their race and ethnicity. Um, and so I try to educate myself at least as much, but I don't think I necessarily pick. I think I'm just kind of like, I know both and I live and exist within both. Um, for me, my family was very much of like, uh, you will either do what we say or you will leave essentially. Um, and so their idea of what they wanted me to be was a white, cis, hetero, Christian male um, that they wanted me to be in every aspect. So when uh, me being, you know, Asian, bi, and very few of the things they expect of me, um, like me being fine with like makeup and like not really caring about like how I dress, if I dress more feminine, like like I don't care if I wear pink. Um, it was very much against what they believed. So like when I was in high school, they, um, my family moved to Boulder. And so I, me, me going to school in Denver, I, um, I remember my parents were like, oh yeah, you can just like, we'll just pay for your gas money to drive down and up every day. And I was like, okay, cool. And then they didn't do that. And so like, I ended up start, uh, like saying, I'm like, um, at my friend's place, um, uh, throughout like a lot of my junior and senior year and to the point where uh, I realized it was like really screwed up when my dad got angry at me for taking out a box of my clothes at this house because he called it the guest room, he didn't call it my room. Although the dog had its own room. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, it was in, uh, just draw whatever conclusion you want from that. Um, and so, yeah, like I stayed a lot with my friends um, throughout high school and they were so sweet and so nice. Um, but it's interesting when you're, when you stay at your friend's house enough that your, their parents say, oh, that's Luca's room versus when you go home and you're told, don't mess up the guest room. Um, so that was, uh, so I was very much like kind of like forced into like either pick like, pick the white culture and like be white and you'll be fine we will praise you for that and like you'll be what we want you to be and you'll be the model minority or be something else and basically like basically be rejected from family so um at this point i've kind of been like well can't really fix the fact that i'm asian so might as well lean all the way into it so eh. And also, I, oh, I'm so sorry, Natalie. Um, I also agree with like what Sean and Natalie did say, like where like I want to like, uh, where like I am an adult and I'm starting to like, think about like my own future and like what I want in life and that kind of stuff like that. And like, if I have a family, like I want to be able to like give them everything that I never did have, like the encouragement to like be who you are to the most, the fullest potential. Um, and I was never encouraged to do that. And like, that's, why I'm like that's kind of like one of the reasons why I like just like leaned heavily into the well if you don't like who I am sucks um and I also lean more into like educating myself on like Asian culture and stuff like that because like if I have a family I want them to have that that experience I don't want them to ever have to experience what I did hmm I've been thinking about this question I think my mom was always a very powerful and like an advocate woman for me. She was like, why fit in when you're born to stand out? And I was like, yes, but when you're in middle school, all you want to do is fit in. I don't want to stand out. I'm okay with being a pigeon, a flock of flamingos. That's okay. And I think especially when it came to like 
family on my mom's side because they have much more like aunts, uncles, like the whole shebang, and all of them were white. I think I really felt like to fit into this family, my culture had to be white because in the conversations and like the TV shows and how they dressed and it was just so much easier for me to be accepted if I embraced more of a white culture than try to both embrace and also teach more of a Chinese culture, feeling like I don't want to be the expert in every conversation and always have this work put on me, like I'm supposed to teach people about this. But then at the same time, it's just so much easier to just accept white culture because, I mean, and it is, it was just easier. I felt like it was easier to fit in with family, with friends, and not be so different. Um, I kind of don't know how to, I don't know. I mean, I definitely did have to choose um, in certain points. And, and like many of you said, it was easier to choose, like, um, sticking with like what my family did and I, I know and the culture I was raised in and so I think um for me the biggest thing that in like we coming into my own identity is trying to figure out one what like what is this culture that I'm making for myself I think right now because I'm very much influenced by um, the culture and the upbringing that my mom and my family has has grown me up in and also this uh, opportunity and avenue to explore parts of me that I don't think I could explore before. Um, and so, yes, I think I had to choose and I hope that I don't have to choose in the future and trying to figure out how can I be okay and hold both uh, simultaneously. When I compare myself from the way I was brought up versus my values that I've um, sustained for myself, um, I didn't want my kids to go through anything I went through. Um, I wanted to be able to have them get their own freedom as to decide who they want to be they wouldn't be happy about being white or being happy being Korean or both, I don't care. Um, I try to do, show them as much, much culture um, um, raising them as possible because I, I was not brought up that way. And I, mean, I felt like I missed out a lot. Um, I also missed out on a lot of family things as well because they kept putting me in private schools and um, pushing me away. And I felt like um, seriously growing up that they really didn't want me around. And that was hard. My brother, which is their child, um, had just about everything any adult would want in their room. <laughs> So I'm talking TV, uh, he had, uh, well back then it would be called Atari, I don't know if you guys know that. <clears throat> <laughs> but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I never got any of the fun stuff, like you know, my brother got everything. So it's like, um, I was feeling so excluded as part of, as what I thought should be part of the family. And, I, and I, that's one thing I do not want to do to my kids. But yes, I'm glad you guys all remember the Atari. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So moving on to our next question, um, what was your journey with navigating whiteness and how do you think race played to adopt played into adoption or kind of like thinking about how various races pre perceive adoptees? Um, I think for me, like, again, I didn't really even necessarily like think of race until I moved to Colorado and realizing that like 
not everyone is a person of color um, and that they're not the majority group of people, um, even though they're starting to become that. So that's getting really interesting. Um, but in terms of like whiteness, I, in high school, I would always joke like, oh, like I'm a white girl. Like I'd go to Starbucks all the time. Like, I mean, I didn't own Uggs, but I also can't afford Uggs. They're too expensive. Um, but like, I'd go like, just do like the basic white girl stuff. Um, and so I would like call myself a basic white girl, even though I knew very much that like I identify as Chinese or like as Asian. And I never even really said anything about like being like Asian American. I never like say that I'm American. I always just say that I'm Asian. Um, and so I think with that and like with being adopted, it's just for me, like my perception of adoption also was just like, there were only like Chinese girls being adopted kind of thing. Um, and I just remember a story of like, um, one of the families when my mom was adopting me, they were also adopting like another like little girl and they got stopped because like the baby kind of looked like a boy and they were like, well, you can't take this child out of the country. Um, since they're so like, at the time they were so like prized in China and, um, also the thought of like only having one child. So it makes me wonder like, oh, do I have siblings that I don't know about? And then also like, why me? Why was I the one to be given up? And so I think it's just really interesting. And I always perceived it as like only Chinese babies being adopted. Um, and so I think it's just something that I'm still learning about and still trying to educate myself on. Um, I kind of am similar to Shion in the sense of like, all the way like to like middle of high school, I was like very much like a, I'm a white person. Like I do very like normal white things. Like I don't like spicy things or some, some stupid stuff like that. Um, uh, I think that race um, heavily, heavily played into the way that I was adopted because, um, so I was adopted twice. We don't have time to unpack all of that. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I was adopted once from China to Colorado and then the family in Colorado, um, some bunch of stuff happened, like a bunch of drama. The mom went kind of insane and threatened to murder me, but then I got uh, my aunt was the caseworker, and so I got transferred over to um, to the family that I'm in now. And I think that race plays a massive reason into why they adopted me, um, because my family is very much of the external look at my actions, look how good of a person I am. Like I go to church, I, I donate to the poor. Um, they're very much of that idea, like the white savior idea. And so when they got me, like they would basically, like if it was like, parading me around me like look how good people we are look, look look at like we're so like culturally inclined and like we're great people um and I also think that like it's funny because the dynamic of adoption went from like for a long time it's always been seen as like something like kind of taboo like especially in like the uh mid like 20th century where like it was like oh like that's not my kid like I want someone that's my flesh and blood and now it's like if it's transracial a lot of times it can be like white savior complex mentality that heavily influences the reason that someone is adopted and I think that's a really really poor an idea because that doesn't mean that you are adopting a child to take care of a child that means you're adopting a child to have as a trophy and that's as as a basis, a pretty poor reason to have a child. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, also based on, I don't know how like other races like um, uh, like how like uh, I don't know like a Asian family adopting another uh, like a an AP to family adopting like another AP to child. I don't know how that would really play out because like I never experienced that. I just know how like white families adopting um, babies of different ethnicities has tends to have a very heavy undertone of white saviorism to them. I was trying to think about my journey navigating whiteness and I was like, so many examples, it's hard to pick one. 
But I think two really stuck out in my head. One was when I was first adopted and came to America, it was interesting. My family didn't want to change my name or like keep my name. They wanted to change it to Natalie Lester because they were already thinking like 20 years ahead, like what kind of job can she get? We want it to be easy for teachers to say her name. And I was like, okay, we'll get into that later. And then my second one, navigating whiteness, was joining a Panhellenic sorority in college. I was like, these girls look kind of fun and kind of joining that to see if I could find sisterhood and then not. And it just wasn't the right fit for me because I felt like there were so many areas that like I just could never fit in. And just it was so frustrating for me of like I didn't want to pretend to be white just to make friends, which is really difficult. That's a whole like paragraph in itself. But I think race really played into adoption, kind of like what you were saying, Luca, with the white savior complex. I definitely felt that not from my parents kind of portraying that message, but more from like outside families saying that to my mom, like, oh, I'm so glad you rescued her. And like somehow this messaging of like, I was broken and needed fixing. And I think it was also played into when like, I was starting to date and my mom was like, oh, like you should look into like, maybe like biracial couple because like Asian plus like my boyfriend was black. That would make such a cute mixed baby. And I was like, mom. And just like how the idea of like being Asian wasn't enough. And oh, so much. how did race play in adoption? Everything. And, like answer with C, all of the above. Um. Mine, I don't know, it's ongoing. Um, I str struggle already because like, when you think about um, how Asian Americans are positioned in proximity to whiteness, it's already like, it is, it, the model minority myth is just like slapped on you. And so what does that mean even more so when then you're raised in that whiteness too? And what do you bring with you from those experiences? Um, from, yeah, it, for me, it's definitely uh, still ongoing. And um, my partner now, he's white. And so something I've been having to talk with him about is like, like I have to figure out my own whiteness and the messiness that I have with myself and with my family. And um, like, this is something that you also have to figure out if this is gonna work because like, like in this partnership, like if it's gonna work, like I have to work on my own whiteness and so do you. And so that's been a really complicated question, but it's been a really um, eye-opening one because I feel like at this point, I can't really have these questions and conversations about white supremacy with my family without them going very defensive. And so having this opportunity with like a partner to have these conversations um, has just been, very interesting like i don't know how to describe it but it's it's almost been like one a way to work through my own whiteness on my own and with him and then also figure out ways to have conversation that may translate to my family that i don't think i can have these conversations with quite yet and like um having a decent relationship with my family and the desire to try to maintain that um like it's trying to figure out how to talk about whiteness um in myself and then with my surrounding like community in like what does that mean and so it's very prevalent in adoption the white savior like yes definitely like and then i think my other like big thing i've been grappling with is my mom adopted as a single mother um at a time when in the u.s you can't adopt children um as a single woman and so at um, something that I've had to contend with with her and my anger, my very intense anger with her essentially because of like how things have unfolded like is that we were both positioned in very like messed up ways by the nation on saying like she's not fit to be a mother because she's not married and she has no man and so like you don't deserve it and then the way that I was positioned at it in China as being like we need to have a son instead of a daughter or we need to try to make sure we can have a son because of like family lineage or, or whatever it may have been and so it's kind of trying to see how whiteness is the thing that's separating me and my mom who i do have a good relationship with in really fucked up ways excuse my language but like in really messed up ways of like it is the 
it is for me the bigger complex that's putting us in locations where it doesn't want us to talk and so for me the biggest thing is how do I push through and like try to have these conversations um growing up I I know I feel like I pretty much dealt with being forced to be whiteness versus um, enjoying my own ethnicity, whatever that was growing up. And so I think um, seeing how my parents treated me versus my brother so differently, um, I, I hope, uh, you know, I, I kind of worked away from the whiteness because of that reason. Um, so I'm like, well, okay, maybe all white people are kind of trashy like the way they are, I don't know. But I've talked with other um, adoptees of different color race and they, they also kind of had the same complex as I did of, of mood swings of trying to figure out okay um am i that bad of a person this is something that i kept saying to myself growing up because i felt like i didn't belong with the white family even though i tried very hard to be as white as can be joining sports doing all the white things people like to do you know um so uh, going to church hanging out with the white groups hanging out with you know all the white family members, you know, that I was brought up with. So it's, it's been, it's been trying. I think my aunt, my, my mom's side was by far the only one that treated me like what I should have been treated by my own mother. So I just hope, uh, you know, I, I would rather be who I am now than what I was because I was very happy with myself. I didn't feel like I belonged. So finding a connection within myself to figure out what is it that I am happier with. So I don't mind the whiteness, but I do mind the way that I was brought up and how differently it was from my me and my brother because i have figured you know we should still be treated equally same respect love whatever no not at all yeah so unfortunately we are um running out of time for the session but we do have one more um just as an end note um, what makes you proud to hold your identity and or to be PETA and what do you want people to take away from this? Um, I think I really pride in being a PETA just and I think it a lot of it is from APAC and just being able to have that community and being able to find people similar to me and I think also um, like we're told like fit in and like just like keep your head down and be quiet and like that whole like um stereotype of like we're submissive and for me I'm a very like outspoken person and so it's kind of funny when people expect me to be this quiet little Asian girl and I'm definitely not and I'm like I'm short but I'll still like I'll come for you um and so I think like for me like being able to like hold on to my Asian identity and definitely learn more about it. It helps me stand out more and I can be like, yeah, I know about all this cool stuff. Like, what do you know? Um, and so in a sense, I have definitely gotten better at being able to accept that I'm different. And now I basically pride myself in being different. And it's definitely something that I think is the best. And um, in terms of what I want people to take away from this, I think, we've all come from that place of, in terms of being adopted, it's like, it's hard because you don't know where you are with your own identity and it's your own journey in terms of 
like who are who am I and everyone goes through that in college but it's like even more so when you have a lot more to deal with but just thinking of um at least from my perspective I feel like I've just learned so much more and it's helped me grow so much more and it's made me a better person. Um, I'm proud to be a PETA um, because this, uh, because like there's this idea of like banding together while having different cultures and different experiences and having that umbrella term of everyone is human regardless and we acknowledge each and every one of your individualities and what makes you special what makes you you and i think that's really i've never really had like anything like that um growing up and um in terms of what uh what i want someone anyone to take away from this if at all um your identity is something that you claim and no one gets to take that from you I think what makes me proud to hold my identity is spaces like this. I was thinking of when I was like a freshman student and Kaylin and I were both freshmen in the same year and how much I would have longed to have a community and a space like this and what that impact might have been on my college experience and kind of me as I was developing. So I really just appreciate having time to be in community and even talk about this and find other people with shared experiences like this made my Tuesday. I think what I really want people to take away from this is, and I had to tell myself this a lot, is like, you are enough. I always felt like, especially in this identity, I wasn't enough of either. And really after kind of hearing conversations and the more that I've been in community with people with this identity is that we are all enough. So really taking that with you. Um, uh. I think, I don't know, um, I think this for me is just a lot of nostalgia um, of the fact that like APAC in the last six years, yes, it's been six years, in the last four especially has like meant a lot into the transformative like things that this community does is like very real, even if it manifests within the like four walls of CSU or not, like um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to explore these things and I feel really grateful to be here with all of you um, and to have the opportunities to think through um, my identity and the ability to run away my first two years and also really come to embrace it my last two at least of my undergrad um, and what I, I think like my big takeaway that I'm still battling with is like you don't have to choose and um, like I don't know 100% how to do it, but in the last two years, I've just really learned that like I don't, like I don't have to choose one, and I can do both. And for me, for me, my big one is like mothers, right? Like as adoptees, a lot of times we have two mothers, and that's really, really intimate to me. And so I have my mom, I call Barbara, my mother. She's been there for years, and I also have a mother who gave me life, and. Um, I'm learning to love and hold both of those as well as all the dichotomies and like the potentials outside of those right outside of I don't have to just be like the culture of white or the culture of Chinese or Asian right like I'm I am trying to make this other path and so I'm just wanting that is my thing of trying to figure out what it means to not have to choose and to be fully whole and hoping that that is something that can be achieved. So I don't know, but we'll see. Yeah, so this concludes um, our try to understand session for today. Um, our next session will be on April 28th at 5 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time, and we're going to be covering mixed race identities. And we also have a survey that we would like for you to fill out. Um, the, link to, uh, the link to this is in the chat. Um, we want to thank all of you all for contributing to the discussion, and we hope to see you again. We'll keep this chat open uh, for those who want to stick around for more discussion. Thank you everyone.